And here we begin to move into the realm of emergence, emergent complexity, which we will first look at a couple of crude passes at it. First, emergence driven by biophysical properties. And do not freak out if you don't know what I mean, because I have no idea what I mean by that. So I will explain it in a more accessible way. And this was something that was explained endlessly by a guy who used to be in the bio department, a developmental botanist named Paul Green, who died about 10 years ago, way too young from cancer. He was a really good guy. He would give this famous lecture where he would start off and he would describe some sort of disk. And the point is the disk, the material inside was of a softer material than the material on the perimeter. And he'd be putting up math at this point that I didn't understand. But it was sort of a disk like that. And then he would show that what happens if you heat the system. What happens if you put heat on a disk like this? And what he would wind up showing, going through agonizing amounts of math, is that when you heat a system, the only solution for this system that's trying to respond to the heat, but in different ways on the perimeter versus the inside, is to come up with a double saddle, a double saddle shape. And the math proved this. And I had no idea what he was talking about. You come up with a double saddle shape. And then what he says is, so that's how you get a potato chip. You take a slice of potato where there's more resistance on the perimeter and less on the inside, and you heat it. And the only solution to that problem is to come up with a double saddle uh, potato chip shape. And if you change the outside, the force of it, if you take one of those like great organic give you the runs type potato chips, where it's going to have the skin left on the outside, it's going to be a somewhat different shaped double saddle. Because there's only one solution <coughs> mathematically to that. And then you sit there and you deal with a very simple important fact, which is that slice of potato knows no biophysics. That slice of potato didn't fit. There's no gene that instructs potatoes to respond to heat in this way. This was the inevitable outcome of the biophysical properties of a slice of potato. And what he then shows is in plant systems after plant systems, they develop where two shoots come out this way, and a little higher up, two shoots this way, and two this way, and two this way. They're all double saddles. And this winds up being a mathematical solution to a packing problem there when plants are growing their stems. There's no genes specifying it. You don't need genetic instructions. It is an emergent property of the physical constraints of the system. Another example here that's sort of proto-emergence, somewhat simpler versions, this phenomenon of wisdom in the crowd. And this is one was first identified by Francis Galton, who was some relative of Darwin and started eugenics and was bad news in that regard, but famous statistician. And being an Englishman somewhere in the 19th century, he spent huge amounts of time going to state fairs and county fairs or whatever. And he was at this fair one day where they had some oxen up there. And they were having a contest that if you could guess the exact weight of the oxen, you would get to milk it or something. I don't know what the prize would be. And there were hundreds of farmers around filling out little pieces of paper where they were guessing. And what he discovered at the end was that nobody got the answer right. Good. So the owners of this get off easy without having to give up any of their oxen milk. But he then did something interesting. He collected all the little slips of paper. And he averaged all of them, and it came out to the correct weight within an ounce. In other words, no individual in that group had enough knowledge to be able to truly accurately tell what this thing was, but put them together in a crowd, and out comes the right answer. Another version of this, and one of this one is deeply important in terms of Western intellectual tradition, back to, is that program, Who Wants to Marry a Millionaire, does that still exist? in reruns and OK, so it was this one, it was this, they, they give you questions. And if you answer them, they give you money. And it's great. And at various points, if you're stumped, you got three things you could do. One is they could eliminate. you got four choices. They can eliminate two of them to make it a little bit easier for you. Another is you have this expert who you can call up. And the third option is to ask the audience which they think is the right answer. And all the audience there has these little buttons. So they can choose A, B, C, or D of the multiple choice there. And 
What the logic is supposed to be is cut it down to two. Your chances are better if you have to guess. Talk to your wise expert who's sitting by on the phone there, and they're going to be wise and be able to hopefully answer this question, or ask a whole bunch of people. And they would all vote, and any smart contestant would choose whatever the audience chose. Because when the audience was asked, 91% of the time, they got the right answer. They got the majority of people voting for the right answer. And this is more wisdom of the crowd. And this was a much better hit rate than whoever the expert was on the other side of the phone. One person could be extremely expert, but they're not going to be as expert as a whole bunch of somewhat decent experts thrown together. This is the notion behind a field called prediction markets, where what you do is you are trying to predict some event. For example, the Pentagon is very interested in using prediction markets to try to predict where the next terrorist attack might be. And what you do is you get a whole bunch of experts, and you ask each of them to think about whatever the parameters are, and take a guess as to how long it will be before the next one occurs. And what you do is you average them up and assume there's a wisdom of the crowd thing going on, and that will give you lots of information great case of this a few years ago, there was some submarine or something that sunk somewhere out in the Pacific and the ocean. And nobody knew where it was, but they kind of knew where the last sighting, the last recording was from it. Whatever, they had a whole bunch of naval experts. And they had all of them sort of bone up on the knowledge of what was the water temperature and wind speeds and where they were in the last sighting and what was on TV that day or whatever. They got all the information and each one made a guess as to where it would be on the map. And you put them all together and they had guesses covering hundreds of square miles of ocean floor. And they put it all together and they came up within 300 yards of the right location. So what we have over and over here is this business of put a lot of somewhat decent experts together on a problem, and they will be more accurate than almost any one single amazing expert at it, under a few conditions. The collection of these partial experts can't be biased. Or if they are, they all have to be biased in a random scattering of directions. And they need to really do be somewhat expert. If you get a whole bunch of people off the subway in New York and ask them to guess, guess the weight of the oxen, they are not going to wisdom of the crowd their way into being able to milk the thing afterwards. You've got to have people who have some experience with it. And you wind up seeing wisdom of the crowd stuff going on in all sorts of living systems. For example, here is an ant colony. And here's a dead ant. And they're trying to get the dead ant back to the ant colony. And when you look at these things, they know how to get it, or they get some dead beetle or something to eat. And a whole bunch of ants push it over back to their colony. Oh, does each one of them know exactly where they should be pushing? No. What you have instead is each ant has somewhat of the right idea as to where they should be going. And there's more ants that have a reasonably accurate notion, a smaller number that are somewhat off, a really small number that are way out of whack. Because in general, ants are kind of experts at finding ant colonies. They're pretty informed. And what you do is you put them all together, and you do this vector geometry stuff. And it moves perfectly in that direction. And no single ant knows exactly where the colony is. You've got a wisdom of the crowd thing here going on.